today we're going to go over the inverse trig functions and their applications. So we're going to start off talking about properties of inverse functions just in general. And if you remember from when we when we did our inverse functions, we had when we did composition of inverses, we said this is always going to be equal to x. We talked about this again when we did logs. And now we're talking about the same exact thing when we're doing trig functions. Okay, so if you take, if you compose the function with its inverse in either order, you, you will always get x. And basically that's what this is saying right here. So the in, so we're doing this is the inverse of the function, which if we were to write this out as a composition, this would be f inverse composed with f of x, right? So and the other, this would be the opposite direction. This is f, uh, sorry. This is f composed with f inverse of x. And basically when you have inverse functions, they cancel. So notice these are gonna cancel each other out and we end up with X, okay? Similar to if I have the square root of X squared, as long as X is greater than or equal to zero, I can say that these are inverse, that these are inverse functions, square root and squared are inverse functions. So they cancel and we would just get X, okay? I, I know we've talked about this before. So the thing I want you to notice here is that and it just, just we're going to work on this a lot more, but notice here the outside function is the inverse. So what we're going to return when we have an inverse function is we're going to return an angle. And what we're going to return when we get a function is the, um, the range of the function. So let me see if I want to clear that up or if I'll clear that up later. Um, I think we'll clear that up later. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So again, review of properties of functions and their inverse. So we just talked about this. The inverse of the function is always equal to x for every x in the domain of f and for every x in the domain of the inverse. So we just talked about that. The, and another important property for inverses is, is that the domain of the function is equal to the range of the inverse and vice versa. The range of the function is equal to the domain of the inverse. We've talked about that before a few times. Um, the graph of F and F inverse are symmetric to Y equals X, same as we've talked about for um, other inverse functions. And if a function y equals f of x has an inverse function, the equation of the inverse is x equals f of y. So all we're doing is changing um, the x and y, which we, uh, we've done before. So if I want to find out what y is, it's equal to the inverse of x. So let's start talking about the sine function. So one important feature of inverse functions, if you don't remember, is they have to be, they have to be one-to-one -one functions. So what does that mean? It means they pass the horizontal, they pass the vertical line test and they also pass the horizontal line test. So that for a function, what we know is that for every value of X, there's only one value of Y. So we have to have that to have a function, but now for a one-to-one -one function, for every value of Y, we can also only have one value of X. So if we look at this particular problem, this is the sign, and we can see this is not a one-to-one -one function because if I use this as my vertical line right here, this pink line, I can see that it passes through many y values, the many values of y that are the same for different x values. So this function is not a one-to-one -one function. 
So if, I don't know if you remember, but again, I'll remind you that we can, we can um, restrict the domain. And once we restrict the domain, then we can say it's a one-to-one -one function. So for the sign, we restrict the domain between negative pi over two and pi over two. That gives me every value of every value between negative one and one for the sign, which we have to be able to produce for a y value, every value between negative one and one. And if all I keep is that blue part of the line and all the black goes away, we can see that it becomes a one to one function. OK, so for the sign here, we have this. But for the inverse sign, I don't know if it says it on the next, I don't know if it says it on the next, I'll, I'll say it here. So the inverse sign of X equals Y. So now here X has to be, okay, this is what I wanted to say before, before I get to this. So remember, if I talk about the sine of theta, equals y, I'm taking the sine of an angle and I'm returning a value on the unit circle or the length of one of my legs of my triangle, right? If we talk about the unit circle, always I'm putting in an angle. It could be in degrees or radians, it doesn't matter. And what I return is a value on the unit circle, right? If I talk about the inverse, and I'll call this, I'll, I'll say the same thing. Well, now what, excuse me, I just made a mistake here. So now what I'm putting in is my value and I'm returning an angle, right? Because remember the domain and range switch. So now my, the, my X value, this is a value and I return an angle. My domain is a value, I return an angle. So for the inverse, I can say X, because it has to be a value, has to be between negative one and one, right? And my Y value or my angle, um, should I call it theta? No. So my Y value is now gonna be between negative pi over two and pi over two. Okay, so this is my range of my sine function after I restrict it. And it's also the domain of my um, inverse, okay? So it's really important. And if we look at this on a unit circle, because sometimes it's easier to remember it this way, this is negative pi over two, and this is pi over two. So we know that for inverse functions, I have to return a value in either quadrant one or four but it has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. And when we get to some problems, I'll explain the difference. Okay, so here, so it says evaluate the inverse sine function for the following, for the, for the values given. So let's talk about A. So it says Y equals the sine, the in, that means inverse sine of the square root of three over two. Now, what I could do to make it a little easier, if you don't know, if it's hard to read like that, basically I can take the sine of both sides. So I can say the sine of Y is equal to the sine of the inverse sine of the square root of three over two, right? And then because of my F composed with F inverse, these cancel. And what I end up with is the sine of y 
is equal to the square root of three over two, okay? And if I look at my unit circle, well, sine is positive in quadrant one and quadrant two, right? And this is a positive value. But I just said that we had to make the function one to one. So we can't answer, which means that it has to be in either one of these quadrants because it has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. So first thing we can do is we can say, this is not an, a possibility. We want one answer. Okay, well, what value of sine, what angle, when I take the sine of it, gives me the square root of three over two? Well, it's this one up here at 60 degrees or pi over three, right? Right here, I have my x is going to be one half, and my y is the square root of three over two. So my answer to this problem is pi over three. So y equals pi over three. Okay. Now, that's the only answer. We're only supposed to get one answer because remember, we've made it a one to one function. So for Every value I put in of X, I get one value of Y. And for every value I put in of Y, I get one value of X. So this is, this is strictly the answer. If you're not sure, basically you just wanna make sure that pi over three is between negative pi over two and pi over two, okay? So that's how you do A. Let's do B. So for B, we have Y equals arc sine of negative one half. Arc sine is exactly with no difference, the same as the inverse sine of negative one half, okay? Literally exactly the same. You can write them either way, whichever way you like. So they're the same, okay? And then depending on what you wanna do, if you wanna start saying here, what angle, the, like the question here is what angle gives me negative one half for the sine of whatever my theta is, right? So that's basically what I'm being asked. If I look on my unit circle, I know that, so negative one half sine, or, or I, here, let's do it the way we did before. So if we take the inverse of both sides, so I'll take the inverse of y, is gonna equal negative one half. I basically wanna know what angle y is. I know sine is negative in quadrants three and quadrant four. Okay, so again, we said it has to be between negative pi over two and pi over two, which means that it can't be it can't be in quadrant three because it has to be somewhere between these two values, okay? So the way I like to solve these, and you can do whatever you like, I always look for the reference angle. How do I look for the reference angle? I actually say, let's see what happens when it's positive. So to find my reference angle, I, I actually say, um, so if, let's say I want to find my reference angle, I can say the sine of one half has to equal y, right? So here my reference angle, where does the sine in quadrant one equal positive one half? It's at pi over three. I'm sorry, pi over six, right? 
So I know my reference angle and I know it's not. So now I have that. I know it's negative. So I know it's got to be here in quadrant four. Now here's the tricky part. The answer here for theta or for, we don't, we're not using theta, are we? So my answer here for what does y equal? So y is going to equal negative pi over 6. Now, some of you may say, well, what about 11 pi over 6? Let's just write that in here, 11 pi over 6, because that's the same point in quadrant 4, right? But the problem is that net 11 pi over 6 is not between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. It's, it's greater than pi, 11 pi over 6 is greater than pi over 2. That would tell me I'm in quadrant 4. But if I use negative pi over 6, I'm in quadrant four and negative pi over six is between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So hopefully that's understandable. Okay, let me do, let me put another slide in here just so I can do problem C without erasing. So I have Y equals the inverse sine of two. So I have for C sine, it was inverse sine, right? Y equals, okay, got it. Sorry about that. So I have Y equals the inverse sine of two. Well, if I were to take the sine of both sides, these would cancel and I'd end up with the sine of y is equal to two. But really what is the range of sine? If I drew a graph, sometimes it's easier to see on a graph, sine looks like this approximately, right? Where the, the maximum is one and the minimum is negative one. So there's no place on a unit circle where the sine of y equals two. There's no place anywhere where the sine of y equals two. So we would say this is undefined or no answer, undefined, no answer, whatever you like, not, not applicable. I mean, I'm not sure, whatever Alex says, but those are, this, this problem is not, not something we can do because we can see that the sine of y is never equal to two, hopefully. Okay, so that handles those kind of problems. Now let's do one where we're actually composing the sine with its inverse. So again, I have to watch what's on the outside, first of all. So here on the outside, basically the inside here is gonna return an angle. And then I'm going to take the sine of that angle, and this whole thing is going to return a value. That's important. Why is it important? Because it's got to return a value between negative 1 and positive 1, right? Sorry, and positive 1. Because we know the sine of an angle is equal to a value. Well, we also know that we can cancel these because we said that F composed with F inverse of X is equal to X. So this composition, I have the answer to the, to the answer to A is going to be one half. That's my answer. I cancel them. I get one half. I'm done. Okay. Whenever the sine function is on the outside, you're always going to get a value. And that value, of course, has got to be between negative one and one. Okay, so that's A. So now B is going to be a little different. 
because my outside function is inverse sine. So I'm gonna return, this right here returns a value. Yes, this returns a value. And then if I take the inverse of a value, I'm gonna return an angle. And that angle has to be between negative pi over two, I'll call it theta, and pi over two, right? So let's see, we cancel these out because they're inverses of each other. And what's my answer? Pi over four. Is pi over four between negative pi over two and pi over two? Yes, it is. I'm done. Okay. C is a little trickier. C is trickier because, again, same as before, I'm going to return an angle. If I cancel these, I get 5 pi over 6. But 5 pi over 6 is in quadrant 2. And I know my answer is got to be between, is first of all, it's got to be in quadrant one or four, and it's got to be between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So is five pi over six between negative pi over two and pi over two? So here's negative pi over two, that's my minimum. Here's positive pi over two, that's my maximum. And we can see that five pi over six is not in that interval. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to find an equivalent value in that interval. How do you do it? Find the reference angle. This right here is the reference angle. So my reference angle for this is equal to pi over six. Hopefully by now you know how to find reference angles if you don't I highly recommend you go either to the Math Learning Center or you set up an appointment with me so I can explain it because you do need to understand reference angles. This is what we've been building to. So we know our reference angle is pi over six. The sine of pi over six is the same as the sine of five pi over six because they're both positive, right? So I can say my answer to this entire problem is the same as the sine of pi over six. So, I mean, so I'm sorry. So pi over six is the same as five pi over six as far as returning the right value. So my answer to this whole problem is pi over six. Because if I put in, if I find this, if I find this, the sine of five pi over six is going to be uh, negative square root of three over two comma one half. And also the sine that over on this side, it's going to be positive the square root of three over two comma positive one half. Notice the y values, you know, the y values are the same. So I can, I can use pi over six to get the same answer I would have had if I had five pi over six. And it is in the right range between minus pi over two and pi over two. So hopefully that makes sense. This is the hardest part when you have to find the value that's equivalent to a value that's outside of the range. I think that's the hardest part for people to understand. If you answered five pi over six, it would be incorrect because if we go back to our original function here that we drew, we can see that we have to, we have to be between negative pi and pi over two, negative pi over two and pi over two, and five pi over six is somewhere out here, which is not in the domain of the inverse. Okay, so hopefully that, un Hopefully that's clear. We're going to do the same thing for cosine. Cosine has a different interval, if you notice. Because if I went from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, 
we can clearly see it's not a one-to-one -one function. So we can't restrict it the same way. If I did that, I would have a function that's not one-to-one -one, and that function also doesn't have any negative values. So I have to change my restriction. And for this one, I change my restriction to between zero and pi. So we start at zero. So my, so let me write this out. So that if I say that, let's say this time theta is equal to the inverse cosine of X. So what do I want? Yeah, okay. So here, X has to be, well, X has to be between negative one and one, obviously, because we can't find the cosine of anything other than the, from negative one to one. And I can say my theta is going to be between zero and pi. And so if I look on my unit circle, I'm, my, if you remember my sign was over here, my cosine is the top half of the circle. Okay, so that's where I restrict it between zero and pi. And we can see if I do that, I have a one-to-one -one function, okay? Again, let's look at the different problems we have here. So I, I think at the beginning, maybe it's easier for you guys to switch it. So I could say this is the same as the cosine of y equals zero. Where does the, where does the cosine equal zero? Well, when y equals pi over two, right? The cosine of pi over two is equal zero. Great. Is that between zero and pi? Yes, it is. So that is the answer, pi over two, okay? Let's do the same thing here. So basically, again, arc cosine is the same as inverse cosine. I don't know why I like the inverse better um, than the arc, but some people like it the other way. Just do whatever, they're, they're identical. So here, if I take the cosine of both sides, I would get the cosine of y is equal to negative the square root of three over two, okay? So again, I look on my unit circle and personally, I like to make it positive. I, I wanna find the reference angle. So I ask myself, what is, cosine of y, I'll call this the reference angle, is equal to positive the square root of 3 over 2. Let me put this as, over here we'll call this y sub r, which is now my reference angle. How do I find my reference angle? I'll just make it positive. And that's going to be in quadrant 1, and it's going to be at pi over 6. Because if pi over six, the x value is the square root of three over two. So now I know my reference angle, but, and that is in the range, but that's fine, but I need the negative. So where else is cosine negative? Cosine's negative in quadrant two and in quadrant three. But quadrant three is not between zero and pi. So I don't worry about that. Okay, so if I know this is pi over six, I know that's pi over six. If I know that's pi over six, I know this is five pi over six. And I, that returns the negative square root of three over two, right? So my answer, so I can say my reference angle is pi over six, but my answer is five pi over six. That's my final answer, and that is between zero and pi, and it would return a negative value for my cosine, okay? Last question. I have y equals inverse cosine of pi. 
This is something you have to be really careful about because every semester people answer negative one. And that's not correct. Why is that not correct? It is correct if I asked you what is y equals the cosine of pi, then cosine of pi equals negative one. That's true. But this is the inverse cosine. So if I were to switch it to the other side and make it cosine, I would have cosine of y is equal to pi. Okay. It still looks possible, right? Because pi, you know, pi is between zero and pi, except for one thing. You have to think about this. Pi is equal to 3.14 dot, 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 right? 34159 block and onward. Well, where, where on the unit circle does the cosine equal 3.14 blank, blank, blank? It doesn't because it's always between. So remember, this is gonna return a value and that value on the unit circle so the cosine of theta is always between one and negative one, right? And 3.14 or pi is not between negative one and one. So again, for this, there's no solution because pi is bigger than one. Okay, so don't get confused. I know it's confusing when they throw that pi in there. It makes you, it makes you think more about angles, but remember that's a value. So it is really important to remember that the range, the domain and range are switching. So you're actually inputting a value and outputting an angle as opposed to when you do the, the regular, not the inverse of it. Okay, all right. So now we want to evaluate these expressions. Again, the outside is cosine. So what am I returning? This returns an angle and the cosine of an angle, the whole thing returns a value. And then we look, the answer, if we cancel these two things out, we get 0 0.73, which is between negative one and one, that works. We, we've got we've got an answer that works. So that that's literally all you have to do. Again, same for B. These are inverses of each other. They cancel. I get pi over twelve. The last thing I have to ask myself is is pi over twelve between zero and pi. And of course, we know it is. So my answer is pi over 12, okay? Last one, again, we cancel. We get four pi over three. Is four pi over three, so this is right, this is right. Is four pi over three between zero and pi? Well, this is the same as one and one third pi, right? So that's more than pi. So it can't be four pi over three. So this is not the right answer, but there is an answer. So let's figure it out. We'll look on our unit circle and we know this is in quadrant three because it's one and one third more, right? And my reference angle here is pi over three. This is my reference angle, okay? In quadrant three, we know our cosine is gonna be negative. Just keep, keep that in mind. Not that we care, well, we do care. So because my answer is gonna be negative, right? Because cosine is X and this would be negative one half comma negative the square root of three over two. The only other place that that works where I have a negative value for my cosine is in quadrant two. I get the same exact value 
for cosine, sine is positive, but we don't care because we're working on cosine. So I want to know what this angle is. And what do I know? I know this is my reference angle, which is equal to pi over three. Okay. So if my reference angle here is pi over three, and I need to be in quadrant two, what is my value? My value is, sorry, my value for this entire thing is not four pi over three. This is wrong. It's going to be two pi over three. Two pi over three is between zero and pi. And notice my cosine values for both are the same. They're both negative one half. So that gives me the same answer as if I could do cosine of four pi over three. And that's, I know this is a little complicated and it's gonna take some practice, but that's basically how you do those inverse functions. Okay, so now we, when we got to this slide, notice we were canceling because they were inverses of each other. Now we basically have inverses, but the inverses are, uh, they're not the same function. So how do we solve something like this? The best way to do it is just to draw a triangle because when we're given this value here, I know for sure that this is a value. And if it's a value, then it's the sides of a triangle, right? So we can say, and I'm teaching you this. I mean, you could, for this one, you could probably do it without a calculator uh, pretty simply, but I'm gonna still show you what I want. What, I'm, I'm gonna still show you a technique that I think is easier. So basically this inside function, uh, let's write it over here. Let's say we have, Remember, this is going to return an angle. This time I'm going to call it theta is equal to the arc sine of negative one half. So that means that the sine of theta is equal to negative one half. And the sine is always equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So what I can do here is I can say, if this is my theta, the opposite over the hypotenuse looks like that. And because the hypotenuse is never negative, this has got to be negative, the y value. And then I can solve for my x value, for my other value, right? So I have negative one squared, if I call this x, plus x squared equals two squared. One plus x squared equals four, x squared equals three, x equals the square root of three. So x here equals the square root of three, okay? And we know it can't be in quadrant three because um, we're arc sine and that's between negative pi over two and pi over two. So, if, so we can only be in quadrant one or four. If sine is negative, we're in quadrant four. So in quadrant four, the cosine is positive, okay? So now I've taken this information and I've drawn a triangle. Once I draw a triangle, and I don't need to know what theta is, right? There's no reason for me to know what the angle is because I can take the tangent of this triangle. Remember the tangent of theta is gonna equal the opposite over the adjacent. And if I want to know what the opposite over the adjacent is, it's negative one over the square root of three. This is fine. This is a good enough answer. I can rationalize it and I would get negative the square root of three over three. So either one of these answers is the correct answer for A. Okay. Because I, I didn't, I, once I draw the triangle, I draw the triangle by using the inverse. Then when I go to take the tangent, I just use the triangle for the tangent, okay? So now for B, 
it's a little bit different because notice it's backwards. So for this, if I want the inverse sine of the cosine of pi over three, well, I can't draw a triangle because I don't know what, how big the sides of this triangle are, but I do know what the cosine of pi over three is, right? So the cosine of pi over three is one half. So I really am asking you, what's the inverse sine of one half? That's gonna be in quadrant one, the value. So it's the Y value. Where is the Y value one half? It's when theta equals pi over six. So my answer for this would be pi over six because on the unit circle, I'll draw it a little smaller here, at pi over six, this point is the square root of three over two comma one half. So there's my one half. This gives me my right value for sine. So the answer here is pi over six. Hopefully that was understandable. Okay, let's do this problem. So again, I don't have any angles, but I do have a value here. Since I have a value, I can draw a triangle. Like if you just can't think of what to do, draw a triangle. If you can draw a triangle, you have the answer. You, you'll find the answer to your question. Okay, so this is a right triangle. I'm gonna call this angle theta. And remember, this is going to return theta. But I'm not using a calculator, so I don't know what the answer is going to be. I don't care. What I care about is that this, this is the same as um, theta. Uh, no, this is the same as the sine of theta is equal to negative 8 over 17. If I could find theta, which I could do if I had a calculator, I could find the answer to this, but I don't have a calculator. That's okay. I know that the sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I know this is eight and this is 17. And because the hypotenuse can never be negative, I know my sine is negative. If I call that X, then I know that negative eight squared plus X squared equals 17 squared. Let me find, let me do what negative 17 squared is. Hold on one second. It's 289, so I have 64 plus X squared equals 289, x squared equals 225, which means that x equals 15. So I know this is 15. Again, sine has to be in quadrant four because it's negative and it can only be it can only be in quadrant one or four. So it has to be in four. Everything in quadrant one is positive. So in, in quadrant four, the sine is negative and the cosine is positive. So I'm in pretty good shape here. So I have my triangle. Once I have my triangle and I know, I don't care what my theta is. It's not asking me what theta is. I can find this tangent of this triangle. So I can say that the tangent of theta is going to equal the opposite over the adjacent, which is negative 8 over 15. So that is the answer to this problem. This equals negative 8 over 15. Okay, so basically drawing a triangle will help quite a bit especially for things where the, the, you can't cancel anything, okay? All right, so now this looks really harder, but it's not, it's the same thing. I wanna explain why it's 